I'm Rabbi Nina Bieber Feinstein, and I'm a lecturer at the Ziegler Rabbinical School upstairs um, in uh, Fila skills. So I teach the students how to um, how to lead all the services for the year and all the tropes. Um, so yeah, so that's what I do here. And I also have a minion that I lead at Valley Beshalom called the Nishama Minion, and it's for women and men if they would like to come. But it uh, originally started out as a service for women. Well, tonight we're going to talk about a very interesting character in the Hebrew Bible, not in the Torah, because she's not in the Torah, she's outside the Torah, and she's not exactly a housewife. <laughs> but as you'll soon see, she was desperate. She, fit, she fits that part. Okay. So who is Rahab? Where is her story found? Why is she mentioned by name in the Tanakh? You know, that's unusual for women to be mentioned by name in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And why is her story significant? The story of Rahab is found in Joshua, the first book of the section of Hebrew, prophet, Hebrew Bible called Nevi'im, or Prophets. The book of Joshua is the, is the continuation of the narrative story of the Torah. So does anybody remember, how does the Torah end? With the death of Moses. Moses dies, okay. I didn't hear you. Joshua takes over from Moses, and where are all the people? On the, on the east side of the Jordan River. Side. That's correct. How did you know that? Did you read already? All right. <laughs> oh, that's right. She went to Hebrew High. Okay. So that's right. So um, Joshua replaces Moses. They're waiting on the east side of the Jordan River, uh, just outside of Canaan, Canaan. And this book, Joshua, was thought to be authored by Joshua himself, who had become a leader under Moses and was chosen by God to succeed Moses. Joshua was also credited with the last eight verses of the Torah. How come? What was that about? Moses died. Moshe died. So you don't write about your own death. So Joshua wrote those, according to tradition, Joshua wrote those verses. The book of Joshua gives the details on the fulfillment of God's promise to the people to give them the land of Israel as a homeland. So when they got there, was the land of Israel empty? No. Who was there? Canaanites. The Canaanites. The Canaanites were there and they had established cities. This, fa this fact is what creates the tension in the book of Joshua. We were promised a homeland. If this land was our destiny, and part of God's promise to us, why do we have to fight to get it? Why wasn't it just given to us by God who can bring about miracles with a mere utterance from his or her lips? I don't really have an answer for this, except to say that we appreciate that which we work for much more than things that are just given to us. And also it seems that God wants us to live in this world as it is and not to rely upon miracles for salvation. We must learn to bring about our salvation through human means. And so, as God, as God says to Joshua in the first chapter of Joshua, chazak ve'ematz, we have to be strong and of good courage to bring about our own redemption. The encampment of the Israelites is on the eastern side of the Jordan River, Canaan being on the other side of the river. They were situated in the lowlands of Moab in a city called Shittim, which was parallel to the city of Jericho. The mention of Shittim is very significant for our story. It reminds the reader of a very different story in Numbers 25, 1 to 9. It too is an account of a meeting between pagans and Israelites, but the outcome is quite different. Let me read it to you. So I, I brought it with me. I forgot to put in the sources, so I'm just going to read it to you. It's pretty striking. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. 
And Israel joined himself to Baal, Peor, Baal Peor. Okay, that's the name of the God. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moshe, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the burning anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moshe said to the judges of Israel, Slay every one his, um, his men that have attached themselves to Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moshe, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tent of meeting. And when Pinchas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aharon the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the chamber and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. So. That's a story of meeting between Israelites and Canaanites. And so let me ask you, was the killing justified or unjustified? What do you think? Unjustified. Why was it unjustified? Yes, it is, it is a sin. Um, so so it, it can feel like it's unjustified. It was symbolic really because they only killed two people. And at that time, I think Human life didn't have the, that meaning that we have today. I'm not yes. so sure about that. <laughs> I think it did. I think it did have a lot of value. I'm sorry. She said she wasn't sure that human life had the same value as today, and they only killed two people, so it was a symbolic killing. I think it wasn't symbolic at all. I think it was very real, and it was a message, right? Do not do this <laughs> to the rest of the people. And there was a plague going on, and by killing those people, the plague ended. Okay. But I don't, know, I don't know whether it's justified or unjustified. This story just is, and it's a very dramatic and telling story. I want you to keep it in mind as we talk about the story of Rachab, because you're going to see there's some, something different about our story. Yes? Definitely, there is, and the you cannot kill, so that will not be anyway justified. There are justified killings, though. You know that in the Tanakh. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, and just think of the point of view of the story towards pagans. What's the point of view of the story towards pagans? Trouble. They're trouble. <laughs> they are trouble. And one way to get rid of them is? Kill them. Kill them. Yep. OK. All right. Keep that in mind. OK. <laughs> Not for our own day, of course. <laughs> um, Jericho is seven miles north of the Dead Sea. What is one fact that you know about Jericho? It was walled. It was a walled city, right? The famous song. The, um, OK. What does that say to you about the city of Jericho? Who said that? Yes, it was, it was really hard to conquer. It was a strong city. And it was actually considered impervious to attack. It would take some kind of a miracle to breach those walls, which according to archaeological finds, in the area revealed that the city was surrounded by not one, but actually two walls, an outer wall and an inner wall, which was a ways up from the outer wall. And Rashi comments that the city of Jericho was like a guard for the rest of the city, for the rest of the country, I mean. And that's why it had to fall first before the rest of the city, the rest of the country could be, <laughs> sorry, um, taken. Because Jericho was a gateway city to the land of Canaan, it was a good place to get a sense of how the Canaanites were feeling about the Israelite encampment on their doorstep. And so begins our story in chapter 2 of the book of Joshua. So if everybody could take out your, your um, supplements. And um, we are going to start reading. And this, by the way, you're not going to find, uh, you're not gonna find this um, translation anywhere. Uh, I got it from a book written by Tikva Freimer Kensky. Um, and I, I wanted to use this one because it's the most literal, although I noticed she left out one word here. But I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, anyway, so let's read chap um, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. Joshua ben Nun sent out from Shittim two men, spies. He said, Go, 
see the land and Jericho. They went and came to the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab. They slept there. Okay, that's the first verse. Is there anything odd about this verse? What's odd? This lady in the back. Right, they're supposed to go look at the country. <laughs> she said, she said it's a covert up, and we laughed. But actually, that's not so far from the truth. Okay, I like that. Good thinking. Okay, so. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. The other thing is, we don't know how long they were out before they went to Rakhaz. <laughs> they could have been out for two or three days from the Israelite camp and been surveying the, the uh, land, etc. We don't know that because it doesn't tell us that. Okay, you could be right on that, Sarah, but actually, most people think that they went straight to Rakhaz's house. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. So we'll get, we'll get to why in a minute, okay? <laughs> but you, should ju you just should know the most commentary to think that. Anyway, um, so Rahab was a harlot, a prostitute. And the Hebrew word for that is zona, right, zona. There's an attempt in later rabbinic literature to give this word a different meaning because of the place that Rahab eventually was seen as ascending to, as the ancestress of a line of prophets. Let's look at source number one, that's page three. Eight prophets who were also priests were descended from Rahab the harlot, namely Neria, Baruch, Saraya, Machseya, Yirmiyahu, Chilkia, Hanamel, and Shalom. Rabbi Judah says Hulda the prophetess was also one of the descendants of Rahab the harlot. Okay, and now I'll also look at number three. And this is um, what I brought here was you know. Um, on the Hebrew Bible, there is an accompanying text in Aramaic called the Targum. Okay? This is from the Targum, and they're translating Beit Isha Zona. So it's translated as Levait Itata Pundakita. Now, Pundakita means an innkeeper. Okay. So, um, you know, a lot of people got hope from that. Well, maybe she wasn't a zona. Maybe, maybe she was an innkeeper. And how could an innkeeper come out of the word of zona? Does anybody know? What do we say after the meals? Birkat? Hamazon. Okay? Same uh, root, same sounding root. Okay? So they thought, well, it's a place where people go, they sleep, and they get food. Um, so, that, so they were hoping that, but it turns out that in the rest of the Targum, every time the word Pundakit is mentioned, it's a euphemism for harlot. Okay. Okay, so um, we, can't, we can't really get away from it. Um, so why would they use this euphemism for, for her? Well, one of the reasons in the commentators is that they didn't want to besmirch the characters of the spies by associating them with a the prostitute. The spies were thought to be two prominent men in Israel. And in fact, um, they, they were named in the rabbinic literature as Caleb and Pinchas. Pinchas was that guy in the story I just read to you that killed, that killed him. Okay, so he had great stature because he rose up and killed them and he looked like a you know, hero in the eyes of all of Israel. And Caleb was one of the original 12 spies who were sent by Moshe to scout out the land. And he was revered because he was one of the two who came back and gave a positive report as opposed to a negative report. Okay. She was a general too, right? I don't... It's a different Caleb. They're all lead, they were all leaders. They're all leaders. Yeah, he probably was. How could they go to a prostitute's house right away? And how could their mission have failed so quickly that they would have to leave off traveling through the land to get the feel of what was going on? Okay. The root of the Hebrew word zona is the same for feed, as we said before. And in fact, many innkeepers were probably involved in prostitution for their guests as a service. The people ate, slept, and got additional services at the local inn. 
So for the sake of the spies and Rahab's future descendants, our rabbinic sages wanted to change her image. <laughs> the Hebrew Bible, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, I think that Rahab was not, a, was not a Jew. That's correct. Then how could she be the mother of... Uh, we're going to get there. We're going to oh, get sorry, there. Sorry. The Hebrew Bible is less apologetic. There's a trend to name people according to a predominant trait or role in life. And Rahab's name is indicative of her position. For anyone who speaks Hebrew, what word does the name remind you of? Rachov, Rachov. And Rachov means? Street, street right. So she's a? Street street she's a street walker. She's a prostitute, OK. The word also ri reminded me of the word Rachav. What is Rachav? Wide, wide. wide or broad. And that reminded me of a, you know, a prostitute's broad, welcoming hips. OK. We, in fact, still use this to mean a woman in our slang terminology for women. We use a word, a broad, right? A broad, to mean a tougher, street smart kind of lady, right? In the Hebrew Bible, at each of the crisis points of the Jewish people, that are being navigated by male Jewish leaders, a woman, Jewish or not, becomes the conduit to enable the Israelites to succeed. The midwives in Egypt help the nation survive the tyranny of slavery. And here, Rahab becomes the conduit for the birth of the nation in its own land. In this sense, the name Rahab, which means broad, can be seen opposite Mitzrayim, the name of Egypt, which means narrow. A suggestion of one of my students, actually. I, I thought it was brilliant. And instead of constricting the future of the Israelites, Rahab opens up the land to them. If we don't want to suggest, as some sources do, that the spies were found out right away and therefore merely ended up at Rahab's house by accident, why would it be a good thing for the spies to end up in the house of Rahab? And I think you've really already answered it in part, right? Um, any other ideas? No. They could get in without, in other words, they, it's a good place. People are coming in and out. They, they're not uh, attracting any attention. But as you'll see, they attracted plenty of attention. Yes? You can pump the customers for information. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Rahab was getting traffic from all over the country. And she knew, she knew better than anyone how the whole country was doing. And their mission could be accomplished in one place very efficiently. <laughs> also, many out-of-towners come to such a place, and the, the spies could arrive there undetected. So let's look just for a minute at source 5 on page 3. The rabbis taught. There have been four women of, I'm sorry, it's misspelled, surpassing beauty in the world. Sarah, Rahab, Abigail, and Esther. Okay? These were the four that they mentioned. But, <laughs> but notice that Rahab is right in there. She was considered one of the most beautiful women in history, hence attracting, in another midrash that I didn't bring, all the leaders of, every, every leader from every city in the land, all the, you know. Um, and look at number six. There was no prince or ruler who had not possessed, oh, Rahab the harlot, there it is. It was said, she was 10 years old when the Israelites departed from Egypt, and she played the harlot the whole of 40 years spent by the Israelites in the wilderness. At the age of 50, she became a proselyte, said she, may I be forgiven as a reward for the cord, window, and flax, for hiding them in flax and letting them down by the cord through the window. Okay. So that is, um, we're going to get to that part. We haven't got to it yet. We've, we're actually only on the first verse still. Can you remember another story that had spies in it? I, I just mentioned it. The 12, <laughs> the 12, the 12 Right, the 12 spies. Right. That's in Numbers. The story's in Numbers 13 and 14. In that story, Moses publicly chooses the spies, who are the heads of 12 tribes, they go on their mission and report back to the people as a whole. Ten of the twelve spies felt intimidated by the people living in the land, 
And so when they came back and reported it, they lowered the morale of the people. And they lowered it so much that the people was unable to enter the land at that point, and so they had to wait. That's why in our story, and this is the one word that um, uh, is not in this translation. If you look, if you can read the Hebrew, it says, Vaishlach Yosho ben Nun min ashitim shnaim anashim meraglim. Joshua sent out two spies, cheresh. That's a weird word thrown in there, and we don't know, but it, it's taken to mean secretly, quietly. He didn't send the spies. He didn't say, I am choosing spies to go spy out the land. He had learned from what mo happened to Moses, and he decided to do it quietly so that, um, so that he doesn't have to say anything until he actually gets a report. And if the report is no good, he won't lower the morale of people. But if the report is good, he can tell the people. Okay, now let's go on. Verses 2 through 5. Yes. Thus was said to the king of Jericho, Look, men have come this night from the, Is from the Israelites to scout out the land. Did they get through undetected? No. no. <laughs> okay. The king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying thus, Bring out the men who come to you, who have come to your house, for they have come to scout out the land. The woman took the two men and hid him. She said, Yes, the men came to me but I did not know where they were from. The gate was about to close at dark, and the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Chase after them quickly, for you may overtake them." Okay. So what do we learn from the situation in Jericho from reading these verses? First of all, what must have, what must have been going on in the city right about then? There were spies everywhere. Why? I did heard someone say they were afraid. They were afraid they were going to be invaded. Right, you're afraid. There's, they had, undoubtedly yeah. had spies on the other side of the river. Right. I wish I had a whiteboard because I would draw you a little picture of Moab and where Shittim is and Canaan and where, and where uh, Jericho is. It's like this. Okay? It's, it, they're right. They could probably almost see them. Yeah. <laughs> they could. Um, so the city was on alert, right? They, they were worried. There were lots of people camped out there. They, and they didn't, they didn't want uh, them to come in. Um, so they were sensitive to people coming in and out. And they knew right away that they were there. So what else do we find out? Well, don't, don't forget, he, wasn't the, he was kind of the regional king, okay. but they were, they were small. Oh, they, they were not like... Uh, it's like an overlord. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about Rahab? What, what happened when they got to Rahab's house? What do you learn there? How did they feel about Rahab? They must have trusted her, right? She was a pagan. They, that wasn't the, no, why did the men trust? I didn't mean that. I meant why did the guards, <laughs> the guards, why did the guards trust? This is a, they didn't, what, what could they have done, the guards, from the king? They could have barged in and searched the house. Somehow they didn't do that. But she was a respected business Yes, <laughs> right. And so if all of the, if everybody came to her when they came to town, you're not as likely to go be brusque and invasive at that house because maybe your boss is there. Or is something. I don't, I, that, boy, you're way going way farther than I would. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, they, they did trust her. She, she was trusted by them. They did not suspect her. And they, they came in, yes. Maybe the guards knew her in a biblical sense. Maybe so. <laughs> they might have known her. OK. Um, and they also kind of considered her honest, right? Mm -hmm. She wouldn't tell a lie. She was a faithful. She was faithful, right? It's according to them, she was faithful to the kingdom, and she was knowledgeable. Why? Because what did she tell them to do? And what did they do? They did it. <laughs> they did what she said. She was thought of as a wise person. She knew what to do. What do we learn about Rahab from this story? She was, brave, really, right? 
She was really brave, wasn't she? Yeah. And she was quick-witted, wasn't she? They came. I mean, how would you feel if men, armed men, came to your door? Would you know what to say, Sarah? Soon we will have an indication. Okay, I'm going to tell you soon. Okay, but we know that she thinks quickly on her feet. She knew what to say to the guards of the king, and she was also not intimidated by them, which is very interesting. I mean, I, I certainly would be intimidated. I heard somebody comment when we read him, the word him, just a minute ago. A close reading of the Hebrew text of verse 4 reveals another parallel to the Exodus story. The word in Hebrew for hid him is vatitz pino. It says hid him. Okay. And there's a problem with this word, right? Because mm -hmm. why? There there's two spies, not one spy. Many commentators try to find reasons for this word in the text. And they say, perhaps she hid him in a small space where they looked like one person. Or maybe one of the men was invisible, he was an angel and he was invisible, so he didn't need to be hidden. Um, but there's another explanation, which is much more reasonable, um, and that is that this verb is found in only one other story, in almost exactly the same form. And it is when Moshe's mother saves him by hiding him. And the word there is vetitz penehu, which is almost the same as vetitz peno, ehu and o, they're, they're the same really. And our verb reminds us that the verb in the Exodus story, uh, our verb reminds us of the Exodus story and it hints to us that there should be a parallel, we should be making a parallel between the story of the Exodus and our story here of the entrance into the land of Canaan. Aligning the two stories is a reminder that even though the Israelites are to conquer the land themselves, the whole experience is due to the divine will, who at times brings miracle, um, as we shall see in chapter 6. Now let's look at verses 6 and 7. She had taken them upon her roof and hidden them in the flax that was spread out for her on the roof. The men chased after them by way of the crossing of the Jordan. The gate was closed after the, pursuer, after the pursuers went out. Okay, so what's the problem with those two verses? Do you see it? They are on the roof. But did you see it said um, back in verse 4, the woman took the two men and hid him. Well, then again in 6 it says she hid them. Right? So it seems like that verse is kind of out of order or something like that. So, because um, it wouldn't be logical to hide them again, or would it? Some com commentators say that the verse describes how she had hidden them in verse 4. So it's just going back to explain to you how she did it, just in case, she, just in case they did barge in, how she did it. But others say that she had hit them in, she was hurried. When she heard the knock on the door, she hid them hurriedly and then later moved them to a safer place just in case what? They might come back. They might come back. So she didn't want them to be found. Verse 7 says the gate was shut behind them. What gate were they referring to? Oh, you're all pretty, you're pretty much in unison there. Um, the city gate, okay. Yes, it could be the city gate. So why would they want to close the city gate behind them? So, so that if, so that, wait, the men can't come back? How about they can't go out? How about they can't go out? They can't go out. Which means, by the way, that they must not have been, um, as you shall soon see, uh, no, they, they must not have been customers of Raha. Okay. Um, other commenters, uh, commentators say that this might have been the gate of the house of Raha, so that the guards would be kept out of the house should they decide to return. So that's another way of looking at those gates. Mm -hmm. Ah, you don't like that as much. Okay. All right, so now let's go on, verses 8 to 14. They had barely laid down when she came up to them on the roof. She said to the men, I know that Adonai has given you this land, and that dread has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted before you. 
For we have heard that Adonai dried up the waters of the Reed Sea before you when you left Egypt, and what you did to the two Amorite kings across the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, that you utterly destroyed them. We heard and our hearts melted, and there is no spirit left in anyone because of you. For Adonai your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Is that it? Oh. And now, swear to me by Adonai, inasmuch as I have acted benevolently toward you, you will in turn act benevolently toward my father's household, and you will give me a truthful sign. May you grant life to my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and everyone that is theirs. May you rescue our lives from death. The men said to her, may our lives die instead of yours, provided you do not tell about this matter of ours. And it will be when Adonai gives us this land, we will act benevolently and faithfully toward you. Okay. So now let me ask you, why did Rahab decide to hide those spies? As far as she's concerned. As far as it's good business. <laughs> yeah. She wanted she wanted that leverage. Yeah. You said she started with ten or some such thing. She became Well, I didn't say it. The Midrash says it. <laughs> she became a working woman very early in life. I would think she became very clever at a very early life, early age, and just became brighter and brighter as time went on. And she had more and more clients. Right. Mm -hmm. And she's had so much experience, God bless her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she has. Okay, so she was clever, and she wanted leverage to save herself and her family from the destruction of the city that was going to come. That was basically what everybody said. But how did she know that it was going to come? How did she know? She knew what happened in the past, and one of them is the immediate past. She right. So she knew that she, first of all, she knew she was fighting the Israelites, but she wasn't just fighting the Israelites. Who was she also fighting? I can't hear him. Sorry. The God. The God of the Israelites. And she had heard reports told of what had happened both at the Red Sea and in um, in Moab, right, with the two, uh, the two Amorite kings. And she heard how they had all been utterly destroyed. And so she thought, well, that's what's going to happen to us too. She, okay? According to Jewish tradition on this text, Rahab converted when she said in verse 11 that God is the only God in heaven and the earth below. You're looking. Okay. She did say that. We heard and our hearts melted, and there is no spirit left in anyone because of you. For Adonai your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. This puts the saving of the two spies in a different light. She is loyal to her new people and thus saves the lives of the two spies. She also fulfills their mission as spies. How come? What did she tell them? She t what did, but what did she essentially she tell them? What were they supposed to find out? She need to find out about con they need to find out about the condition of the land, what, what the morale was in the land, and if they could possibly conquer the land. Did Rachab tell them? Yes. yes, she did. She gave them the information that they needed to boost the morale of the people before they, they, they were going to go off to war. So they're going to have a psychological advantage before the fight. In verses 9 to 11, Rahab also reveals herself to be a prophetess. Not only has she revealed the exact information that the spies needed to know, but in addition, 
Rahab predicts the outcome of the conquest, something she could not have known. Rahab's words are reminiscent of Shirat Hayam, the Song of the Sea, which is found in Exodus 15, 14 to 16. These words were used in Exodus to cause dread to fall on enemies of Israel. And so this is what she uses in Joshua. By using these familiar words, Rahab is able to convince the spies that they're going to be victorious. And she is the key to bringing the successful conquest of the land by raising the morale of the nation of Israel. She's also the first oracle after Moshe to announce the future history of the people of Israel. That's pretty stunning. Why is it necessary for Rahab to ask the men to spare her family's lives? Because you know, not everyone is always killed in the course of the battle, right? right. But she knew that there were, she knew, because she's a prophetess, and from the, their actions previously, that there would be a slaughter. Right, so let me tell you how she knew. Rahab is reacting to a mandate from God to kill every Canaanite inhabiting the land. This command to annihilate all of them has a special name. It was called cherem. You know that word, by the way. What do you know it from? That's a later rabbinical use of the word, but you know it from an Arab source. What is a harem? Right. They're taboo, they're forbidden, and so the pagans and all their stuff is forbidden, right? So it's, it's actually from the same word. Let's look at sources, source number eight. This is Deuteronomy 20, 16, 8, and this describes cherem. Only in the towns of those peoples that Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance, you are not to leave alive any breath, but you are to devote them to destruction, yes, destruction, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Chivite, and the Yevusite, as Adonai your God has commanded you, in order that they not, um, they not teach to you to do anything to all their abominations that they do with their gods, and you sin against Adonai your God. Okay, so do you see, I heard someone say, wow, it is, it's very, very radical. This other one, Deuteronomy 7.2, and Adonai your God gives them before you, and you strike them down, you are not to cut with them a covenant. You are not to show them mercy. That's in our Tanakh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So, why did God make such an absolute and to our ears ethically problematic command? The premise is that the objects or people which uh, could pollute the faith of Israel had to be kept away from the people. Therefore, they could not even take any booty from the conquest of the Canaanites because if they derived any benefit, they might attribute that to the Canaanites or the Canaanite gods. So the annihilation included people, animals, cult objects, cattle, and booty. I mean, all the stuff you might get. It was as if all these things were a whole burnt offering to God. And in addition, the city could never be rebuilt. Why didn't Rahab ask the spies to save herself as well? By the way, that was why she had to ask them to save her family. But why didn't she ask about herself? What happened in verse 11? She converted. She was Jewish. So she's no longer subject to the harem which is really interesting because that means that a pagan could assimilate and therefore be free of the harem, which is a whole different approach to coming and conquering other than, other, other than total annihilation. Okay. You kind of addended yourself on, you know, to the people. They seem to accept it. There seems to be a duplication of words in verse 13. Rahab first asked the spies to spare their families' lives, and at the end of the verse she adds, save us from death. The Malbim, a 19th century commentator, sees two requests here. 
The first is simply to spare the lives of her relatives. The second is a plea to save them from spiritual death by allowing them to convert after the invasion. The problem is they can't convert yet, right? Because there's just, it's too many of them and it's going to happen too imminently. So, and this is not as far-fetched as it sounds, by the way, because, and you're going to see that at the end of the story. I hope we'll get to the end of the story. I'm keeping, I have a clock up here, so I'm keeping my eye on the time. In ancient times, taking an oath was the same as signing a written contract. A person who swears an oath may not nullify it. When people swear an oath to do something for a person who has shown them chesed, chesed meaning loving kindness, as Rahab had done for the spies, they were again not allowed to nullify the oath. And an act of kindness is something that's done for another person that goes beyond the obligation that is legally required. Since Rahab saved the spies' lives, they were legally obligated to her to save her life at some point. Therefore, her request was for her family, whom they were not obligated to save, but could spare as an act of chesed towards Rahab. That is why in verse 14 the spies say, and here it isn't translated exactly like this in our text, but it is in other texts. We will save you as a token of truth and kindness. Okay? Chesed vemet. To save Rahab is an act of truth and justice because she saved them, so it's only right that they save her. And to save her family is an act of kindness above and beyond any obligation that they had to her before. The two spies agree to the oath. But some moments later, they seem to renege on it a bit. So let's read on what happens in verses 15 to 21. Remember, I just told you, you can't renege on an oath. And then suddenly they are reneging. OK, so here's verse 15. She let them down through the window by a rope. For her house was in the fortification wall, and she lived in the fortification. She said to them, go to the hills, lest the pursuers encounter your way. Hide there three days until the pursuers return, and then go on your way. The men say to her, We are quit of this oath you made us swear. Look, we are coming to the land. Tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you have let us down, and gather into your house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's house. And it will be that whoever goes out of the doors to the outside, his blood is on his head and we are clear. And all who will be with you in the house, his blood is on our heads if anyone touches him. And if you tell about this matter, we are clear from the oath that you have had us swear. She said, it is according to your words. She sent them off and they went. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. Okay. I want to note just um, that the text mentions that Rahab lives in the actual city wall. And this becomes very problematic at the end of the story in chapter 6, but we'll see it when we get there. Okay, so just remember that this text said that. Verse 16 brought further proof for many commentators that Rahab was a prophetess. For how could she have known that the pursuers would return in three days? A few commentators say that Rahab was simply using logic. It took about a day to get down to the Jordan River where the best place to cross was, and then, then it was a day looking around for the spies, and then a day coming back, so that would be three days. However, there is no way that she could actually have known exactly, and so she is considered a prophet. Why did the men leave by using the rope to climb down from Rahab's window? It got them out, right? Got them out. And also, we heard, we heard that some kind of gate was shut, right? One of the gates. That was the outside wall. That was the outside wall, right. And, and they just got out. Um, and there's also less chance of being seen, right? To, at nighttime to come down a rope. So um, it was a hidden way. It was a hidden way of entering and exiting in Rahab's house. And many people who wanted to enter unseen may have done this before the spies using the same rope. Rashi comments on this verse 
that the very same things that were used for sin were now being used for Rahab's repentance from that sin by saving the spies. Also, the gates of the city were closed. So this way, they were already outside of it, as somebody mentioned, her house being in the wall. Now look at verse 17. We said that an oath cannot be nullified when initiated by another person and made in response to a kindness. But that is exactly what the spies seem to be doing here. A few commentators claim that the first oath that Rahab made the spies swear was made under duress because she demanded it before she actually lowered them from the window. So they were hanging on that rope and she says, by the way, <laughs> right? <laughs> An oath made under duress can be abrogated because it is if it were made in error. So look at um, source number seven on your number page three from the Mishnah. Four types of vows have the sages invalidated. Vows incentive, vows of exaggeration, vows in error, and vows broken under pressure. So that would cover our vow here. But the second oath that the spies would take in verses 18 to 20 was more reasonable than the first one. Okay. Can you see why? Why was the second oath more reasonable? It was voluntary. They were on the ground. They were safe. And it was one site. They had to protect. As opposed to the family being all over the city. It was their Did everybody hear that? No. That it was, see, if they weren't in the house with, in the first one, um, they just, she just had to have the sign. But, and and the, the spies realized there was a problem with that. And one of the problem was, what if Rahab's relatives were all over the place, right? So, you know, how would they have, how would he, they know? And also, by the way, if they all put out the sign, then what would happen? I can't hear you. Somebody, does somebody? Everybody would know something was going on. People would know something was going on. Why, why couldn't she tell them? Why couldn't she tell them? Because if, loose lips sink ships. <laughs> if she told them all, what would, they would all put out a cord, right? And, be, and try to be saved. And, and this was too difficult. Yes? Oh, you are so smart. <laughs> you should be a commentator. Okay. Okay. Well, what could happen if they hadn't made those prohibitions is the question. So in both, both, both times, Rahab had to be quiet um, because they didn't want anybody other than Rahab's relatives to be saved. That was the oath that they took, and that, you know, that was proper. And they also, they wouldn't have any way of knowing who and who wasn't her, her relative. And so they might then have to not kill anyone in Jericho, right? And then how could they have a battle and conquer the city? They couldn't. So they had to ensure that her relatives would be inside that house and um, that the battle could proceed. After the new con um, conditions that were made, Rahab agreed to it. And an oath can be abrogated if the original party agrees that there can be new conditions or that it can be abrogated totally. So this is, it all ends very well. And I don't know your name. Melinda said, quite, she must be a prophetess herself. <laughs> she made the connection between the red cord and the story in the Exodus of the night of the Exodus. What happens that night? They put the blood of the lamb right on the lintel. And what color is that blood? Red. It's red. Yes, it is. Um, and that is how they started their process of redemption. In addition, the Israelite families, where did they remain? Inside. Their inside. Their they stayed inside. And that's where Rahab's family is supposed to be as well. When Rahab puts the sign out, she endangers herself by identifying with the Israelites and their God. She risked her neighbor's wrath at the moment of her family's personal redemption into a new life in Israel, Israelite society, just as the Israelites showed their affiliation with God and people and risked reprisals had the Exodus failed, right? Because 
even though we think that, that the outcome is going to be victorious, there's no assurance in any battle that, a, that it's going to be victorious, right? We hope so, but we don't know. The word for chord in Hebrew is tikvat, and that's very interesting because tikvat sounds like what other word? Tikva, which means hope, right? Um, so the chord, in a sense, becomes her only hope for survival. She and her family are literally hanging by a thread. Let's read verses 22 to 24. They went and came to, to the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers went back. The pursuers searched the whole path and did not find the men. The two men turned back and came down from the hills and crossed over. They came to Joshua ben Nun and related to him all the things that confronted them. They said to Joshua, Indeed, Adonai has given the whole land into our hands, and the inhabitants of the land are melting away before us. So what happens here in these verses? That's right. What she predicted became true. And the spies return to the Israelite camp in three days, and they report exactly what had happened to them with Rahab, what had transpired with her, and they learned, um, they, uh, and they told only Joshua. Okay, only Joshua hears this. Um, I have another little vignette, a little thing to tell you on this side, but I'll just summarize it so, so I'm sure that we'll finish. But the number three of three days does have significance. There are lots of other times in the Bible when righteous people waiting to do something, they're in a state of anxiety, have to wait only three days. Can you think of one person? Esther. Esther, Esther waits three days, right? It's there, it's there in the, I actually have it in number 11. I'm not going to read it. But she waits three days before um, she fasts, she and all her ladies, before going to see Ahasuerus, right? And who else? Who's in a whale? Not a whale. He's a, it's a big fish, by the way, not a whale. Yonah waited three days, okay? And there are lots of people who wait three days, so that's just a little something to tell you about that. So here again, you know, she's, she's like one of those righteous people. I mean, they're like, they are righteous people, the spies, and they are waiting three days to get back to Joshua. The next chapters of Joshua, three to five, tell the preparations of the people for war as they crossed over the Jordan River. The end of our story lies in chapter six of the book of Joshua. So I wanted to read it through because, have you ever read that story? It's really, it's just fantastic. I cut out a little bit that was very repetitious, but I, I would just like you to hear it because it's, it's very, very interesting. Okay, so here's chapter six. You have it on um, pages four and five. Now Jericho was shut up tight because of the Israelites. No one could leave or enter. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I will deliver Jericho and her king and her warriors into your hands. Let all your troops march around the city and complete one circuit of the city. Do this six days, with seven priests carrying the seven ram's horns preceding the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, with the priests blowing the horns. And, when the sound of a horn, and with the sound of a horn, all the people shall give a mighty shout. Thereupon the city wall will collapse, and the people shall advance, every man straight ahead. Joshua, son of Nun, sum, summoned the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carrying the seven ram's horns precede the Ark of the Lord. And he instructed the people, Go forward, march around the city, with the vanguard marching in front of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had instructed the people, the seven priests carrying seven ram's horns advanced before the Lord, blowing their horns, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The vanguard marched in front of the priests who were blowing the horns, and the rear guard marched behind the ark, and the horns sounding all the time. But Joshua's orders to the rest of the people were, Do not shout, do not let your voices be heard, and do not let a sound issue from your lips until the moment that I command you, Shout, then you shall shout. <coughs> On the seventh day, they rose at daybreak and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. That was the only day they marched around the city seven times. On the seventh round, as the priests blew the horns, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and everything in it are to be prescribed for the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot is to be spared, and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers we sent. But you must be aware, beware of that which is proscribed, or else you will be proscribed, be put to death. 
If you take anything from that which is prescribed, you will cause the camp of Israel to be prescribed. You will bring calamity upon it. All the silver and gold and objects of copper and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They must go into the treasury of the Lord. When the people heard the sound of the horns, the people raised a mighty shout and the wall collapsed. The people rushed into the city, every man straight in front of him, and they captured the city. They exterminated everything in the city with the sword, man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and ass. But Joshua bade the two men who spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring out the woman and all that belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father and her mother, her brothers, and all that belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and left them outside the camp of Israel. They burned down the city and everything in it, but the silver and gold and the objects of copper and iron were deposited in the treasury of the house of the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and her father's family were spared by Joshua, along with all that belonged to her. And she dwelt among the Israelites, as is still the case, for she had hidden the messengers that Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. At that time, Joshua pronounced his oath. Cursed of the Lord be the man who shall undertake to fortify this city of Jericho. He shall lay its foundations at the cost of his firstborn and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the land. So what's the reason in verse 17 that Joshua gives to the people for saving Rahab and her family? She hid the spies. But what's the reason in chapter 2? It isn't just because she hid the spies. What happens? She converted. She converted, and then what did what she, what she do to the spies? She, them. she made him take an oath. Remember the oath? The oath of the messengers. Joshua doesn't even mention that. How come? They, I, I can't hear you. I don't know who's speaking. I'm sorry. Oh. Right. Well, here's the thing. The spies took the oath, right? But not the rest of the people. They didn't take the oath. So they weren't bound by the oath. They could have killed them. So he has to... He has to tell them, you know, he, he's, he makes it an act of chesed. She saved the spies, we're saving her. Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't mention the oath because they aren't really part of the oath. You know, in the Talmud, it, it talks about having, having to have war on Shabbat. I mean, it's optimal not to have war on Shabbat, but when you're in a war, you don't stop for Shabbat. Why? Your enemies don't stop. It's a matter of pikuach nefesh, right, of saving lives, and so... You know, in a war, there are different rules for wartime than for peacetime. The Yom Kippur War, right. The war starts on Yom Kippur. The <coughs> troops go out on Yom Kippur, right. Okay, so why does he still call her Rahab the harlot? Doesn't she get to just be called Rahab by now? Identification? Well, it's, it's kind of how we identify with her, you're right. That's a good question. Did she? Okay, well, I won't answer that. Okay, not yet. Um, in action, none of the commentators really have a good answer for this. Um, but there is a modern commentary on the book that brings up the point that the book of Joshua is written from a Deuteronomic point of view. This point of view was very suspicious of foreign impulses and wanted them all eradicated. We saw that, right, when we talked about harem. That's the same point of view. Hence the command to destroy everyone and everything associated with idol worship. In reality, as regards the early history of Israel, it is believed that this didn't happen. You only have to read further in Joshua or in the book of Judges to see a different point of view. In the book of Judges, the Israelites were grappling with foreign influences all the time, and they had to keep fighting their own urge to assimilate into pagan life. 
somehow it was very, very, you know, it, it seduced them somehow. And, you know, it's hard for us to imagine, but imagine this be your world, that you are the very first people to come to the idea of having a go one God, and everybody else around you thinks that that's not true, and that there are many gods, and they have all this pageantry, a long-held pageantry, and all kinds of, you know, art, and, and, and all kinds of interesting practices around that, and that is what you're confronted with all the time. So they're fighting their urge to assimilate. In chapter 9 of Joshua, foreigners who were allied with Israel and joined it were not under the cherem, the same as Rahab. So you see, there was another way for them to associate with the pagans that were around them when, it, when, they, when they came to them at battle time. We, They were trying to coexist, right. We can assume then that Joshua still refers to Rahab as Zona, a harlot, because this story is written from the Deuter Deuteronomistic point of view, which is ill at ease with the power of foreign women, who, uh, this foreign woman, by the way, who operates on the margin of her own society. Keeping any foreign influence alive, no matter what the circumstances, had a negative connotation for those editors. What is the internal story conflict in verse 20 of the story? 620. <laughs> okay, what's the conflict? Her house was in the wall, right? In yeah. chapter 2, they made a point of that. Yeah. And here in this story, the entire wall boom, collapses into the earth. Therefore, wouldn't Rahab and her family have died that way? Yeah. In that, you know, well, what do we do with that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a clever guy um, who is the Vilna Gaon who was a Talmud and Bible scholar who died in 1797, and he gives an explanation. He says, it was the nature of Rahab's house that saved her. She had a house that was three walls, and then the fourth wall was part of the wall, part of the city, of the, the wall of the city, and that she carved an annex out of that wall because she needed that entrance and exit for her clients who did not want to be seen coming into her house. So, right, so her house was kind of built on the wall and in the wall, and they were in the part of the house that was not in the wall. In addition to this, there is archaeological evidence that a bit of the wall did not actually fall. And I don't know how accurate that is. Um, I found this, and I, I really don't know how accurate it is. But some people believe that this is where the house of Rahab must have been. OK. So <laughs> you, have all those, you have all those thoughts. So why were Rahab and her family left out of the camp of the Israelites in verse 23? Why do you think? Why were they left out of the camp? Yes. To make sure they were not killed. And so they weren't killed. They're back there. They're not, they're not right. And also, the only one who converted up to that time was Rahab. The rest of her family was still a, were still pagans, and so they couldn't associate with the Israelites just yet. So they were on the outside, not the in, not inside the camp. All right. What does verse twenty-five add to the story? She dwelt among them. But also, look at it says, all of her family were spared by Joshua, along with all that belonged to her. That's something new. That's something new. We weren't expecting that. Yes? Well, it's that her belongings were not prescribed because she's now Jewish. Right. So Although, I also said yeah. then that the other part of the sentence that's very interesting is where it says, as is still the case. 
So yeah. it's again sort of prophesying that her family stays with the Jewish people and becomes part of us, and then she is the mother of these future prophets. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and what's, it's also kind of amazing because it's exactly opposed to this idea of harem, which is destroying not only everybody but the things too. They didn't have to take her things. She could have gotten new things, couldn't she have? But it says here that he, he, he brought her things along. There is a midrash. Um, look at um, the sources number two, and you'll see something even more amazing. We must suppose that she became a proselyte and Joshua married her. <laughs> okay, how did they get there? <laughs> well, um, because later on, um, she, is, she is cited as a relative of certain people, and so they must have surmised from that that she must have married Joshua. And the two of them had a line, and... and um, and so, and that's the thing about having uh, prophets, you know, uh, those were her relatives. Yes? Why not one of the spies, for example? I don't know. Well, you know, she was very beautiful. I don't know why. <laughs> Answer that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. Did you say something? She was 50. So what? So? <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're treading on thin ice here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Sarah was 90, how's that? Okay. So the question is, and it looks like we're going to finish early. I was so worried about finishing late. What does the story of Rahab add to the story of the conquest of Canaan? And why is the story here? From a, well, oh, I don't know. Am I going to ask you yet? I might ask you again. Oh, I'm going to ask you in a minute. Let me just say this, and then I'll ask you. From a literary point of view, we have acknowledged that women are gatekeepers, the conduits of action at the moments of crisis in Jewish history. Like the midwives in the story of Exodus, or Deborah the prophetess, who predicted success in battle and the doom of the enemy general Sisera at the hands of a woman, history might have turned out differently without their contributions. Deborah appears at the end of the conquest of Canaan and is different from Rahab as could be. She is the leader of her community and has a great reputation. She's strong and direct and known for her honesty. Rahab is the ultimate outsider, first as a pagan, second as a woman, and finally, as a prostitute. Rahab is also clever and survives by her wits. She doesn't act like we might suppose that a prostitute would act. So why do you think that this story is here? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes? We shouldn't assume that just because a person has a certain trade or occupation, that there's a certain set of traits or characteristics that define them. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. It sounds like whether it's facilitate the absorption of the foreigner, the, mm -hmm. and that's going goes through Jewish history for a thousand mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. that foreign nations, foreign people are going mm -hmm. to be absorbed and converted and married into our faith and be Jews. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the jumping off point, like Sephora. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, I, you, I think you're both really close, and you're close to what I thought too. This, um, when I thought about this story, I, I think that there are two main reasons. There, there are other reasons too, literarily, why the story is here. But I think that there are two main reasons that the story of a quick-witted prostitute was presented at the beginning of the conquest of the land. The first has to do with one of the important principles of the Tanakh, and you said it in part, so I'm going to just say it fuller. Um, and this, this important principle was in danger of being desecrated. 
with the carrying out of this radical idea of the cherem. And you've got to realize that was a real thing. It wasn't, it, it wasn't that they, you know, they did it sometimes, they didn't do it sometimes. This was something that people fought you know, and was commanded to them. Um, and I'm referring to the idea of B'Tselem Elohim, that all people are created in God's image. This is from the first chapters of Genesis. Rahab is the least likely person you thought you would meet at the beginning of the conquest of the land. If you had to write the book yourself, would you have started by highlighting the rescue of two leaders of Israel by a pagan prostitute? The story upholds one of the moral imperatives of the Tanakh. Everyone created in the world is created in the image of God and has worth. But why bring this now? Shouldn't the focus of the book be elsewhere as the nation of Israel prepares to take the last step in fulfilling the promise of, the, of, of God to, to inhabit the land? There are two opposing ideas fighting themselves in this story. One idea is the fulfillment of the mandate to procure a safe place for the people of Israel to develop as a people and a religion free of outside influences. The second was the idea of B'Tselem Elohim, recognizing the worth of every person. Do not forget that the latter, seeing the image of God in every person, <clears throat> is a universal value taught to us at a moment in the Tanakh when, when there weren't any Jews, right? In the first chapter of Exodus, this was before we talk about there being Jews in the world. If you view the idea of cherem next to this principle, it's quite jarring. How did we get from seeing the godliness in every person to the place where we thought it was acceptable to wipe out an entire people? Obviously, our ancestors were struggling with themselves and courageously at the moment that they were supposed to be steeped in particularistic actions they told the story of a righteous pagan. They opened themselves to the possibilities of the universal. The story screams out to us to look beyond the outer trappings of people, their looks, their job, even their religion, and see them as people. There are good people in every country, even when it seems that they are all immoral, but that may be because of circumstance, like Rahab. Historians today believe that the cherem was not carried out. In truth, the land was conquered in a set of battles, but pagans were allowed to live. The Jews that lived among them struggled with their Jewish beliefs. As you can read in the prophets, Jews of that time struggled with the idea of monotheism with so many pagan influences around. Ultimately, they believed that they lost the land of Israel due to their own religious immorality. We struggle with the same issues to this day. How particular shall we be as a people? And how universal? How shall the Jewish people survive in the face of assimilation? How much do we let the world in? And to what degree should we block it out? Issues of Jewish survival stand as starkly before us as they did during the time of Joshua. We find no definitive answer to this question in this story of the book of Joshua, but we do find a call to examine and evaluate our beliefs. And that's why I think the story of Rahab is found in Joshua. Do you have any questions? Yes. Why do they refer to uh, the deity as Adonai instead of Yahweh? It, it's the same. Oh, it's the same? In other words... Oh, so, uh, no, so there's no... no I can explain that. I wish I had a whiteboard here. I always love a board in class. Anyway, um, how you write the word Adonai in the, in the Tanakh is Yud, He, Vav, He. And they put different vowels under those. We don't know how it's supposed to be pronounced. So we put different values under, va uh, vowels under that, um, which... Signific uh, they symbolize either Adonai or Elohim. So um, when it says, does it say Yudhei Vavhe in the text? In, 
In these texts, it does. Did you see here? Uh, this is from the Five Books of Moses by Everett Fox. It's his translation of the Torah. And you see it says, yud he vav he Well, that, it's in English. I'm looking at the third page, the third page. Uh, number eight. That's Adonai, where it says yud he vav he and Adonai means Lord, it, so it means God by association. Do you see it? Oh, she's got it. <laughs> you see it? By the way, do you know do you know why they use the word the, the letters Yud Hey Vav Hey? It's a it's a conflation of three words. The the name of God Adonai is a conflation of three words, of Haya. Hey Yud Hey, which means was, Ho Ve, Hey Vav Hey, which means present, as it's as close as to the word is, and Yud Hey Vav, Yud Hey Yud Vav Hey, no Yud Hey Yud Hey, Yi Hiye, which means will be, and when you think of conflating all that together, isn't God that which always was, is, and always will be? That's the word. I don't know. Yeah. I can't hear you very well. I think that's how Hashem identified himself to Moshe as the burning bush. Mm -hmm. It is I, as he was, I am, and will Yes, be. exactly right. Exactly right. Yes. Where does it say that a prostitute is bad? Exactly. No, that is not a dumb question. And actually, I had a whole section about that, which I didn't bring. Um, there was a recent article written about comparing prostitutes in Christian literature to Jewish literature. And in Jewish literature, prostitutes are not necessarily bad. However, rabbinic literature has that connotation. They, were, they, they weren't as um, open as the, as the Tanakh. Um, they felt there were bad connotations to this, and there was a lot of misogynistic influences in rabbinic literature. But here, Rahab is not really seen as, a, she's not bad, is she? She's just a she's a, she's, she's, she has a lot of good qualities and in fact becomes part of the, the history of Israel, the, you know, the, the history of the leaders of Israel. Yes? Is it possible that God saved her? Because God tells the people to go around and shout, right? Mm -hmm. Although it says later in the text that the, the, um, Joshua told the spies to get her out. But then, so the walls fall, but maybe not her part of the wall. Well, that's what the archaeologists say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he says to go and see the land. He thinks they're going to wander around the land. I mean, what, I get, what I'm trying to get to mm -hmm. is that maybe God kind of orchestrates this whole thing. How, how do they know to go there? Does I think that might have been well known. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, d I don't know if these particular ones go to whorehouses because, it, remember, Pinchas was the guy that killed the Midianite woman, <laughs> you know. But, um, but it, it probably was very well known. Don't forget, they, what I didn't tell you was, if it is true that there were two walls to Jericho, the, in, the inner wall and that city in there was for residents. The outer wall was where out-of-towners stayed, like merchants. So they stayed in this outer ring. So obviously there were lots of people coming in and out. And they could have traveled, you know, be traveling. It, it was so close, they could have easily crossed the Jordan and gone to Moab or, you know, wherever they were going. So they could have, they could have known that. It, it's not that out of... I'm just trying to get, like, maybe this is part of, like, the plan from the beginning that she would be spared. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, one could think that, but I, I, ha I don't know. I, <laughs> I have no way of knowing. Do you think it was an earthquake, really? <laughs> oh, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, getting back to the harlots. Colonial America had our own. They became business people. They became mayors. Yes, I mean, yeah. they became leaders. Mm-hmm. 
and that happens in our day too. Remember, I forgot exactly who it is, but in Italy. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm referring to. Okay, she was a, not a harlot. She was a porn star, but she became a, a leader. Mussolini's granddaughter. That was, yeah, I think it was Mussolini's granddaughter. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sarah. Is it possible that in Tanakh times, much like in medieval times, where people weren't necessarily literate, and heraldry was used a lot, that there were signs that said, this is, you know, this is a baker's, this is a chandler's, this is a... A veal repute. I don't know, but one of the commentators mentions that she, it also might have been a cultic uh, a, a, a shrine as well uh, where she lived, and um, therefore people could come in and get asylum, you know, and so maybe, I mean, that's possible, but, you know, maybe it said in, you know, it could have said, you know, well, wayfarers come stay here. Yeah. It, it could have, but it's not clear how they know. But you can only guess, I mean, the, the sense is that this lady is well known. She was a known, trusted, important person who people did not barge into her house. And so, um, so maybe it was just known. Yeah, yeah, a new, a new voice. Mm -hmm. And it was several archaeologists, I don't know if you've ever seen it, and they said they found evidence that there was an earthquake. Hmm. Exactly that time. Okay. She was from England and several. Well, it's hard to know. I mean, there are also people who say that, you know, the Red Sea, that there was a, you know, there was a natural thing occurring. But that it occurred at that moment when they needed the walls to fall down, perhaps that's the miracle, <laughs> right? Yes. Well, my re um, recollection of what the archaeologists say was that Jericho would burn, right. but not in the time of Joshua. Huh. Yeah. It could be. It could be. But, it's, but I also read that they never did rebuild on that city. Um, th where Jericho is now is somewhere is removed from there. It's in the general vicinity, but it's not on the actual spot where the ancient city was. So unfortunately, we don't get too much chance to go to visit Jericho anymore. Yeah. It, it seems to me that the way this character is described and the establishment is described is that this is a place that uh, people of all kinds of uh, stations and uh, life went through there and gossip and rumors and everything went through there. It seems like she was probably very knowledgeable about what was going on. Yeah. And it's also, it seems to me likely such a person at some point somewhere has crossed some of the people that she's from mm -hmm. and was looking for uh, to, to betray them and to get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it, he said that it's that that you know the way she's described, she's probably one of you know she, it is a place where a lot of people came in and out, and, and she would have a lot of knowledge about what's going on, and other people would know because by word of mouth. Is that a good summary? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, one more. I got a question on the uh, twelve spies that went. Yes. Two came back. They all came back. No, no, no. I'm talking about earlier. The, the, the twelve the, spies. The twelve spies. They came back. Yeah, but, oh, but, only, but only two of them said that they was. It, they could do the conquest. That they could. Were they from a specific tribe? One was from. One. Uh, one was Caleb. Yeah, he was from. They, they attributed to this story. Okay. I don't remember who the other one. Okay. Anybody remember who's the other? The other spy. Now, Pinchas. Nach. Joshua. <laughs> right. <Joshua>. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I know. I just I read that story, but. That they, maybe they were from uh, the, the tribes of Judah. Mm -hmm. What later became Judah, as opposed to the other ten, were from Israel. Uh huh. Yeah, they were they were the heads of the tribes, basically, is what it said. Yeah, they were the heads of the tribes. Okay. Well, I think um, the people. Oh, one more question. Okay, can you handle one more question? I hope I can. Okay, go ahead. I cannot hear you. Why doesn't anyone name their children Oh. <laughs> You don't know why we're laughing. Well, you know, I'll tell you something. 
this question is not as far-fetched as, as you think, because a lot of people name their kids Jezebel, and that is a horrible name. I'm not even going to translate it for you. Um, but um, I'm guessing because it keeps saying Rahab Hazona, that it, 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 it's the whole name, you know, Rahab the, the harlot, and they don't want their kids being called Zona. Wow. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just guessing. <laughs> But um, I'm. But no, you're right. Nobody names their kid Rachab. Okay. But if you have a grandchild coming up, <laughs> you could suggest it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much.